Okay, everyone, welcome to the webinar. I'm really glad that all of you could make time to join me this evening. I, uh, I first gave this talk about two months ago in January at the EMF Medical Conference. And I really liked how it went. It was the first time giving it, uh, as I said. So uh, since then, I've updated it to add in some more content based on the feedback and questions that I've got. So you're the first people seeing uh, all the information uh, compiled together in this talk. So first, a quick overview of what we'll be uh, covering tonight. Uh, we'll start with the intro. That'll be super quick, as always, just gives a few more, a couple of minutes uh, for more people to come into the room. Then we'll get into the main content. That'll be about half an hour, maybe 35 minutes. Then, as always, I'll give you a special offer and we'll open it up to Q&A. I suspect the Q&A tonight will be interesting. Uh, this is a broad topic and I know a lot of you have questions about specific solutions, so I'll do my best uh, to, uh, to respond. And before I go any further, this is a reminder that you can ask questions at any time, uh, but you need to type them into the Q&A pod here in Zoom, not the chat pod, because if you type them into the chat pod, they'll get lost and I won't see them. So uh, if you have any questions at any time, just type them into the Q&A pod and I'll get to them at the end of the presentation. So very briefly about me, my name is R. Blank. I'm the CEO of SYB, uh, formerly served on the faculty of the University of Southern California Vitterby School of Engineering. Along with my father, Dr. Martin Blank, co-authored Overpowered about the science of EMF health effects. And this follows a 20 year career in software engineering. So as I said, the intro, very short. Now, as I mentioned, I co uh, sorry, I co-authored Overpowered with my father, Dr. Martin Blank. I did that in 2012. And that's really when I got into this area. Now, while that book and my father's entire career was about raising awareness of EMF health risks, my work is more about solutions, how we as consumers can make technology safer to use for us and for our loved ones. Now, a big part of this is about education, and I'll speak more to that later on in this talk. But another big part of this is EMF protection which brings us to the question, what is EMF protection? What actually is it? Because there are a lot of options out there, especially with the growing awareness of EMF as a real health risk. There are a rapidly growing number of products out there claiming to protect you from EMF. Now, before we dive in further, I want to make it clear that I'm not going to talk about any specific companies or brands of other, of course, than SYB. Uh, I don't talk about specific competitors because I run my own company and I don't feel comfortable commenting on other specific companies. There are some that I have opinions about, some positive, some negative. Uh, and given the explosion in the number of EMF products out there, there are also very many that I've never even heard of at all. People are constantly, almost every day, emailing me to ask my opinion about a product or a company that I'd never heard of until I got that email. Um, so uh, I'm also not going to recommend one specific type of EMF protection over another. Though I do spend some time discussing shielding in particular, uh, since that's the type of product that I create and also where I have the most insight into how claims are formulated. But this talk is intended to help you evaluate claims from any type of EMF protection product. So you can make more informed purchasing decisions because I know and understand how challenging that can be for people. There are a lot of different types of EMF protection products out there. Uh, increasingly, every day, more, a really wide variety. There are electronics accessories like phone cases and apparel like underwear. There are pendants and stickers, neutralizers and harmonizers. There are supplements that claim to reduce or reverse the damage from EMF exposure. There are expensive devices and gadgets that claim to protect your entire home. So the first thing I will say about EMF protection is that it is entirely unregulated. It's like the Wild West. And that is unfortunate. It leaves the industry very susceptible to misleading claims and false advertising, to questionable people and companies selling snake oil and false promises. And even among the companies that sell legitimate solutions, many lie and deceive about how all their products work or intentionally mislead with their testing data. So when you see a new product that claims to be a type of EMF protection, the very first thing you should do is answer the question, what does this product actually claim to do? 
And I know that might sound obvious, but it is pretty key because there are a lot of products out there that make some really broad claims. Like it protects you from EMF, but what does that actually mean? Does it claim to block the EMF? Does it claim to neutralize the EMF? Does it claim to make the EMF somehow less harmful to you? Does it claim to repair damage to your body from EMF? These are all different things. So you need to understand what actual claim is being made. Sometimes you'll find that there's no actual claim. The company is just trying to sell you comfort. Buy this and your problems go away. That is not a product claim. And if a product isn't actually making any specific claims, then that's a sure sign that you need to walk away. Now, I'm very frequently asked about EMF harmonizers and neutralizers. And if you search for EMF protection, for example, on Amazon, there are a ton of options dominating the search results. Some are super popular. These are actually among the best selling types of EMF protection solutions. And I totally understand the appeal. Who would not want a little sticker you could put on your cell phone that makes it safe? I can say that only twice have I ever encountered an EMF harmonizer or neutralizer company that presented science to support their claims, just twice out of dozens of different companies. I've looked at a lot of these. I've seen many that pretend to have science, but when you actually look at it, they don't. And so that leads us to the next very important question. Is the product claim backed by science? Is there any science that can explain how the product works? And does the science make any sense? Now, I know we're not all scientists, probably on this webinar, very few of us are, but even so we have common sense. Does the science the company is making, does uh, presenting, does that make intuitive sense to you when you read it? Or does it sound like fantasy? If after reading about it, you say, that just doesn't make any sense to me, listen to your gut. Alternatively, are they using a bunch of big, long words to make it seem scientific while also being completely indecipherable? I believe that if you're buying a product because it is based in science, then the science should make sense to you, even if you are not a scientist. Now, beyond that, is there any science that can be used for you to test that the product works? Now, before proceeding, I do want to be very clear. A lack of science does not mean the product doesn't work. I have a lot of customers, you know, thousands of them, who in addition to using my products, use other products without any basis in science. Things like pendants and crystals. And they say these products work for them. For some people, it's the only thing they found that they say works. And so I want to be really, really clear here because just because a product doesn't have supporting science does not mean it does not work. It just means that you can't prove the claims with science, at least not yet. Science is constantly evolving. But right now, if a product doesn't have supporting science, it means you can't prove it with science, which makes it very hard for someone like me to support or endorse. But if a product works for you, then please keep on using it, regardless of anything else I say here tonight. If a trusted friend tells you a certain product works for them, even though there's no science, then by all means, give it a shot, especially if you are not finding relief with other means. But if you're gonna spend money on EMF protection like that, at least make the purchase knowing that there is no science and no data to support the claims you are making the purchase based on faith. Now, I generally only recommend products that are based in demonstrable science and have testable claims. And by and large, those are shielding products. Now, I again want to be very clear. There are some other types of EMF protection that are not shielding, that do present scientific backing for their claims. For example, just a couple slides ago, I mentioned that there are a couple of EMF neutralizers that I know of that do have supporting science. And as another example, there's a, a brand of negative ion generator that I am asked about a lot. And they also present scientific studies to support their health claims. So you can certainly review that information to see if it's the type of product that you want to invest in. And I am not saying shielding is the only option with scientific support. 
But even with those non-shielding products that I was just talking about, the, with science, the neutralizers with science, the negative ion generator with science, even though they can present science to support their claims, those claims are not testable by you at home. And that's what I mean by testable claims. And I personally feel very strongly about having testable claims because as we know, EMF is invisible and odorless and tasteless. And as I said, EMF protection is totally unregulated. And unfortunately, there are a lot of snake oil products out there in the world. Given those facts, this is why I focus so much on EMF protection that has testable claims. Claims you can verify for yourself. Hopefully one day when there is more science and more regulation, I will feel more comfortable believing in product claims that are not verifiable by me at home, but we are not there yet. Which brings us back to EMF shielding, which is the type of product that my company, SYB, specializes in. EMF shielding is based on fundamental, universally accepted scientific principles that are almost 200 years old, ever since Michael Faraday created his first Faraday cage in 1836. Electromagnetic shielding works by creating a mesh of conductive or magnetic material to form a barrier that obstructs electromagnetic fields. You can think of EMF shielding like a window shade, except instead of blocking sunlight, these shields block and deflect EMF radiation. So how do you know if EMF shielding works? Oh, by testing it. Now, when we think of radiation testing, a lot of us will think of something like SAR. We've all heard the term SAR before. It stands for specific absorption rate. It's the most common type of EMF testing that people are aware of. It's the type of test they use to pretend to regulate cell phones. And SAR is a measurement of emissions. I'm sorry, it's a, <laughs> it is a measurement of absorption. How much EMF is absorbed by a surface? So a SAR test is, as I say, it's, it's, it, it measures um, how much radiation is absorbed, not by your body, but as you see here, by, by a dummy in a lab. But that's not the type of test that you use to test EMF shielding. The type of test we use to measure EMF shielding is called attenuation tests. Attenuation means blocking. So an attenuation test will tell us how much EMF radiation, something like my SYB phone pouch, for example, how much it will attenuate or how much it will block. And on this slide, you'll see actually so, uh, photos of some of the very first tests that SYB commissioned, I believe back in uh, 2014, of uh, one of our very first products at uh, the UCLA Center for High Frequency Electronics. There are four key elements to an attenuation test. The first is a controlled environment. So you don't have EMF pollution polluting the results. You have an EMF signal emitter or signal generator that can emit very specific doses of very precise frequencies of EMF. You then have some type of thing you're testing that is a shielding product or a material. And then finally, you'll have a frequency analyzer or a spectrum analyzer, same thing, to see how much of the emitted EMF made it through the shielding material to the sensor, right? So those are the four key elements of an attenuation test, and they produce results that look something like this, which uh, are is the test data on I, uh, my neck gator, my SYB neck gator. And so it tells you the frequency and gives you the shielding effectiveness. And you'll note, by the way, the, the numbers are, are, are different at different frequencies. And that, that's the way it is with all shielding products, just because it shields uh, a certain amount at one frequency does not mean it shields the same amount at another frequency. All of these, the way shielding works uh, means that the attenuation effectiveness is actually different for different frequencies. So data like this uh, tells you the frequency and it gives you the shielding effectiveness, often measured in both a unit called decibels and also in percentage. Decibels uh, we've all heard of decibels because that's how uh, volume can be, audio volume can be measured. Uh, it's the same unit here. Um, it, it's a ratio of power. Um, but because decibels really don't make 
the same sort of intuitive sense as percentages. That's why decibels are often converted into percentages. And so companies like mine publish the results of attenuation tests performed on our products to show you that our products actually work. Um, by the way, this is probably a good time to mention that sometimes you'll see tests promoted with certain language. Language like uh, FCC certified or military grade. These terms are absolutely meaningless. As I said, this industry is entirely unregulated. The FCC does not certify EMF protection. It does not oversee EMF test, EMF attenuation testing, period. And there is no quote unquote military grade standard for EMF protection. You should just ignore any terms like this that you see. It doesn't mean the products are bad, right? It means these terms and terms like them are meaningless marketing jargon. Uh, another one that you might see is, is full 5G spectrum. It covers the full 5G spectrum. Uh, and I grouped that same thing in that, say, that term in this same group. No product has been tested against the full 5G spectrum because no testing facility offers that type of testing. Not yet anyway, the uh, 5G is a, is a brand new technology. Uh, the, the, the current deployments don't even use barely a fraction of the full 5G spectrum. So the labs aren't set up to do anything like that kind of testing. So the point is ignore the jargon. All we have are these tests and what the uh, tests mean to us. And these tests, I, I, I want to, these tests are important to consumers because EMF is a complex subject. And as I said, everything, it, it's totally unregulated. And a lot of people don't know how to test EMF shielding for themselves at home. So naturally, uh, consumers are going to rely on tests like these. But what an EMF test means might be different than what you think it means. This, what we have here is the intersection of marketing and science. And there is a lot of wiggle room in the language, especially given the complete lack of regulation. So let's dive in and learn a little more about EMF attenuation tests. And this, this is really, really important. Uh, so please, I just if, if you're gonna ignore everything else in this talk, oh, I doubt you, why would you show up if you did? Uh, but pay attention to this. Um, so let's, let's take an example claim. And you'll see claims like this all over the place, even on my website. Right? Tests show we block 99% of EMF radiation. Now, when we see that, our minds interpret that to mean tests show we block 99% of all EMF radiation. And then completely subconsciously, without even realizing it, we will add all the time, in all circumstances, to the end of the phrase, without even realizing that we did it. Our minds are playing tricks on us and the marketers know it when they write this language. So even though the original claim was, tests show we block 99% of EMF radiation, we read it as, tests show we block 99% of all EMF radiation in all circumstances. And that's super different. Now keep in mind, the original claim, the one we started with, tests show we block 99% of EMF radiation, that is accurate, right? Because tests did show that but it didn't show that they blocked 99% of all EMF radiation. As I was saying earlier, the, the, the shielding effectiveness is different at different frequencies and not all frequencies are tested in a test. That's almost impossible. So the actual original claim is accurate, but what our mind reads it as, it's super different and it actually isn't accurate because the original claim would actually be more accurately stated as tests show we can block up to 99% of, e of, of all EMF radiation in a very specific set of circumstances. So what does specific circumstances actually mean? Well, that is the key point. It refers to the exact conditions under which the test was conducted. What, what type of conditions? Well, conditions like, uh, in what environment was the test conducted? What was the source of EMF in the test? What tool was used to measure the EMF levels? Where was the EMF source and the meter and the shielding material? Where were they all positioned with respect to each other? 
what frequencies were measured, and what product was actually tested. And this last point is key. Just because a company has tested one of their products, do not assume that all their others work too. All EMF shielding products are made with different materials. So a test on one does not apply to others. And by the way, the same concept applies to all other types of EMF protection products that have supporting science or tests, not just shielding. Just because a company can show science or test data that supports claims for one product does not mean that all their products work. So these are all just some aspects of a test that make the test unique and lead to whatever results are generated. Change any one of those factors and the test results vary, sometimes quite significantly. The way a product is tested in a lab could have little relationship or no relationship at all to how you would use the product in real life. In fact, I will go so far as to say lab testing almost never tells you how EMF shielding will work for you in your real life. The testing environment, it is too artificial. It is too unrelated to how you will actually use the product. So you might be asking, why don't companies like mine hire labs to test real world conditions? Because it is a literal impossibility. A lab is by definition, a controlled and artificial setting. It is not possible to replicate the massive variety of real world conditions the different hardware, the different networks, the frequency jumping, the pulse rates, all the different ways you can carry your devices. It simply cannot happen in a lab. So the statement I made here, I think is a strong one and I really believe it is an accurate one. So I've just now spent time telling you that lab testing doesn't apply to the real world. So you might be wondering, is it useful at all? Well, I believe it is. Right? These lab tests, they are not useless because if a company can't show you that their products shield in a lab, then that almost certainly means their products won't shield you in real life either. So you need to avoid uh, shielding companies without testing data for all of their products. But also remember that lab tests do not mean that's exactly how well it will work for you. Instead, Right? The, the test data may say it blocks 99% of EMF radiation. In real life, it may block, the way you use it, 60% or 75%, maybe 90%, maybe 93%. Right, The odds that it will block over 99% of your radiation exposure in all circumstances are zero. No EMF protection product works that way. The real world and real world technology are too complicated for that. So just keep that in mind when you see EMF protection product claims. So yes, you want to make sure the EMF shielding was lab tested, but also remember the limitations of the lab testing. And that brings me to a really, oh, I have to catch up, sorry, on the slides. That brings me to the key point, which is that EMF protection products of any kind shielding or any other kind that you might pick, they are a second line of defense. Good ones, like the ones I make and sell, they are useful, they are good, and they can protect you, but they do not solve the EMF problem. Not a single one of them does. So the best EMF protection is to eliminate or at least reduce your exposure in the first place. So Reduce your use of EMF emitting technology like cell phones and Wi-Fi and smartwatches. Turn it off when it's not in use. Turn your cell phone into airplane mode when you're not using the wireless. Uh, use Ethernet instead of Wi-Fi, right? These are all ways of reducing your use. And then the second is to keep the tech as far away from you as possible when it is in use, right? The further away, I have a phone here. The further away the phone is from your body, the less radiation exposure you are getting from that phone. The same is true for any EMF emitting technology. So that's why, right? So again, reduce your use and maximize the distance. That's why I always say the best EMF protection is free. 
And uh, you see here a picture of the ebook. You can download it at this URL, but all of you will actually be getting a link to download it uh, tomorrow in your email. Um, and EMF protection products are a critical second line of defense. They are important and they can protect you if you buy the right ones. And that's why you need to look at and understand the actual product claims, which is why I created this webinar. And that's how you can tell the real EMF protection from the snake oil that is all over the internet. And that leads me to my final point. And it is an absolutely critical one. You need to make sure to use the product the way it is designed to be used. Again, this may sound obvious, but it is vital because if you don't use the product the correct way, it may do absolutely nothing for you, or even worse, it may actually increase your exposure. Here I'll use the example of my phone pouch. My pouch, it's a little pouch. It's designed to make it safer to carry your phone. The rear of the pouch is lined with EMF shielding. The front is just regular neoprene. This allows you to carry your phone more safely by deflecting radiation away from your body, but allowing your phone to still work. And my pouch does work. It works really well for that purpose. It does not, for example, make it safer to sleep with your phone, right? Because the shielding material has to be between the phone and your body. When you're sleeping, the pouch would be laying down, the back of the pouch is in between you and your phone. It doesn't help when you're asleep. And even though I clearly explain its purpose and use uh, everywhere, everywhere it's for sale, uh, on my website, on Amazon, everywhere it's for sale, people still email in asking, uh, can it help me sleep? Is this gonna help protect me during my sleep? And no, it does not help in that situation at all. So the phone pouch is an effective EMF protection device, but it only works to make it safer to carry your phone. So what's important to remember is that you need to pick EMF protection that works for your needs. If you carry your phone in your pocket, go, you know, go for the phone pouch. If you sleep with your phone and that's where you're looking for protection, then the picture frame is a much more effective solution for you. So you pick the EMF protection that will actually work for you the way you need it to. None of this shielding is, it's, it's not like a magic pendant that you can just stick on your phone and everything becomes safe. I, I wish it were. If I could design that product, I would <laughs> because uh, I'd sell a lot of them, but that's not the way that EMF protection products work. So to recap, when evaluating the claims of EMF protection products, think about what actual claims is the company making? What data is the company presenting to support those claims? What does the data actually say? What was actually tested? and use the product as it is designed to be used. And I wanna emphasize, I know I spent a lot of time talking about shielding, I told you I would at the intro. This list of questions that I covered, and I'm recapping right here, this applies to any type of EMF protection product, not just shielding. So I strongly encourage you to use these questions as a framework to evaluate any EMF protection product, not just EMF shielding based products. And so to all this, I would add just one more thing. I am a very strong advocate for people to learn how to test EMF for themselves. This is really useful when evaluating the effectiveness of EMF shielding products like mine, but it's also super important when trying to learn more about your exposures in general in your life. If you're interested in EMF protection, then you're interested in your exposures. And the only way you can know your exposures is by testing in your home, in your office, in your bedroom or kitchen, everywhere you go. As you all know, EMF is odorless and tasteless. You can't touch or feel it. So the only way to know how much you're exposed to is to test for yourself. And uh, the link here, there's an ebook you can download. It will also be emailed to, to you uh, tomorrow in that same email. Um, and it's this free guide that I've written and updated six times over the past few years. Um, you could download it for free at this URL. Again, this link will be emailed to you tomorrow. It has explanations for the different types of meters. It has meter recommendations and has a useful guide of do's and don'ts to get started testing at home. Now, I know there um, are several questions and I want to get to them. 
Um, I will get to them, uh, but I want to remind everyone that SYB is offering a special coupon to all of you, but it is only for everyone watching live. If you're watching this as a recording, this code will not work for you. If you order anything from my catalog by midnight tonight Pacific time, so that is about set six and a half hours from now, you can save 20% by using code CLAIM20. So just go to shieldyourbody.com, pick out whatever products you want and enter CLAIM20 at checkout. So again, this works on all of my products. It works on my uh, cell phone radiation protection, including the 5G phone shield, the headset anti-radiation device or hard. It works on the phone pouch. It also includes all of my apparel, like the bandana, the neck gaiter, the baby blanket. And it even includes my bed canopy. So if you've been looking at the bed canopy, 20% off of that product, it's a, it's a big saving. So the bed canopy provides outstanding laboratory tested EMF and 5G protection uh, all night long. And, and so just in short, without, I'm not gonna spend time selling you on every, all of my products. Uh, in short, this discount is valid on my entire catalog. So pick the laboratory protection you need the one that works for you and enjoy this opportunity to save 20% on your order. I also wanna highlight for those of you who maybe haven't ordered from me before, any order of my products from my website includes a lifetime warranty. It really is the strongest warranty in the industry and 30 day returns. It is a risk-free decision to order from SYB. So again, if you order by midnight tonight, Pacific time, you save 20% by using the code CLAIM20. And with that, I really wanna thank you so much for taking the time to attend my talk. This really is an important subject and I really appreciate your interest in learning more. And now it is time uh, for questions. So if you have any more uh, questions, just post them into the Q&A pod and uh, let me get started. Some um, with a couple that were submitted in advance. All of you got a link to submit questions in advance. Some of you did. Okay, I'm sorry, I have to look at another monitor to, to pull them up. How does the EMF radiation emit from devices? Straight line emission? What can it penetrate? So that's a really, really good question. No, it is not a straight line. EMF, so again, I'll, I'll hold up my, my cell phone. Uh, EMF from a cell phone goes in every single direction. EMF, I'm pointing, you can't, it looks like I'm pointing at you, I'm pointing at my computer. EMF radiation from a computer goes in every single direction. EMF from power lines goes in every single direction. It, it radiates 360 degrees. Uh, there are a couple of, you know, newer technologies. Um, for instance, you know, certain 5G antennas uh, emit radiation in a straight line, in a direct shot to whatever other device it's communicating with. You know, but in general, EMF, if, if there's an EMF emitting source, it's, e, it's emitting in every direction. And that's why you want to strategically use shielding uh, to, to provide protection against those. Now, what can EMF penetrate? EMF can penetrate a lot of things. Um, in general, it'll penetrate your walls, uh, for example. It'll penetrate your clothes. It'll obviously, it'll penetrate your skin and your body. But each of these things does provide resistance. So that's why, for example, um, your, your, your brain is, is shielded by skull, by bone. And that, you know, that's not complete protection, obviously, um, but that provides more protection than, for example, male gonads, uh, which are entirely unprotected. They are out there, out of the body, no shielding at all, right? So uh, same thing with a wall. Uh, on what it's made out of. You'll know um, a, a lot of times bathroom walls actually provide more shielding than non-bathroom walls because uh, there's more piping in there and the metal piping uh, creates a stronger barrier. The other thing I'd say about um, uh, EMF penetration is that the higher the frequency, uh, the, the easier it is to obstruct it. Right, so that's, that's one of the, the concerns about 5G, why you need so many 5G antennas is because um, even windows can start interfering 
with 5G. Uh, so, so it all depends, you know, there's, there's multiple variables, but the point is EMF can penetrate a lot of different things. Someone asks, is Shungite effective? If so, what brands to choose from and what to avoid? So Shungite, that is a great question. And I am going to pull up here and I'm going to paste it into the chat pod for anyone who's interested. We have a post about that on the website. Shungite is one of those things that I would lump under a lot of people say it works and I haven't seen any data to support that. Um, so uh, in terms of brands, I, I don't, I, I really have no idea. Um, but the, uh, I, I believe that, that um, because Shungite is not, an, uh, it did not originate on earth. I believe it comes from a meteorite. And uh, I believe there's a place in Russia that is supposed to have the, the highest quality Shungite. And so my understanding is if you're buying that sort of stuff, you want to make sure it comes from that same location. Uh, but in general, that's, that's, what I, that, that's a type of solution I would group under. Uh, a lot of people say it works, and I've never seen any data to support that. Um, let's see. OK, here's, uh, and then I'll jump to the, to the live Q&A pod. What truly works to protect my brain and most importantly, my body, if possible, from 5G up to 60 gigahertz? Okay. Uh, so the, the, I liked this question. And the reason is I have not seen any lab data on any EMF shielding product up to 60 gigahertz. Uh, the labs we use don't go up to 60 gigahertz. They go up to 40 gigahertz. Um, uh, so uh, I am not aware of any shielding that I can say definitively shields at 60 gigahertz. I am confident that when I am able to test my products, it will show that it shields at 60 gigahertz uh, because I'm able to show that at 40 gigahertz now. And that includes, for example, my bed canopy is tested up to 40 gigahertz. My neck gator is tested up to 40 gigahertz. I believe, I, sorry, I'm doing this out of memory, uh, but my boxers are shielded up to 60, up, sorry, 40 gigahertz, uh, but they're not yet tested up to 60. As soon as I can, I will. But the other reason I wanted to a uh, answer this question is because to my knowledge, um, uh, there are no 60 gigahertz deployments of 5G yet. Now, I touched on this earlier when I talked about you know, products claiming to offer full spectrum 5G coverage uh, protection. Um, 5G will go up to 60 gigahertz at some point, and it'll go way beyond 60 gigahertz. 5G, the 5G spectrum actually goes up to 300 gigahertz, uh, which is really high energy. Um, and and I, under, I also know why the 60 gigahertz has become an important uh, focus for a lot of people because of certain science that, that shows re, you know, particular types of reactions to that frequency. But there are no... Um, there are no deployments of 5G yet that go up to 60 gigahertz. Almost all 5G deployments right now are actually piggybacking on 4G. So they're really only going up to eight gigahertz. There are a couple uh, of, uh, of initial deployments now that, are go that go up to 26 gigahertz, um, but those are very rare. So really current deployments of 5G from that, from the perspective of which frequencies you're being exposed to, current deployments of 5G are the same as 4G. It, it, in the future, that'll change, but right now they're, they're the same. Okay, now I'm gonna go into the pod, the Q&A pod. Um, anonymous attendee asks if I recommend the Trifield Meter 2 for testing EMF. Uh, the answer is yes, it's the TF2, I believe is the question is about. And, um, and yes, if you download that ebook at shieldyourbody.com slash test, I have a few meter recommendations. My number one meter recommendation uh, for, for radio frequency is the Safe and Sound Pro um, from Safe Living Technology. Uh, but that's, that's not a, you know, that's about a $390 meter. So, uh, and it only does radio frequency. So if you wanted to spend under $200 and get the, um, also the low frequency measurements, then I recommend both the Trifield TF2 and the Cornet ED88T Plus. I know that's a mouthful. So download the ebook because they're both in there uh, along with, with links. 
So thank you, anonymous attendee, who I think identified herself as Tasha in, in, in the pod. Okay, Claire asked, does SYB sell products that protect from all the sources of EMF that I talk about today, or will one have to find another company? Uh, so, well, you know, it, I, I didn't really talk about specific sources today. So I try to create as broad a catalog as I can. You know, we're a small company and we're, you know, expanding as we can. We offer right now, um, I believe it's 16 products. Um, and for a lot of different use cases for carrying phones, for working on your laptop, apparel in general is some of the most useful in terms of, right? Because if, if you're buying, for instance, if you're buying my phone pouch, you're, you're using it to protect from radiation from your phone. If you're buying my laptop pad, it's to protect against your laptop. But there's a lot of sources out there that are not in our, I mean, they're not our tech. They're someone else's tech. It's the neighbor's Wi-Fi uh, or the cell tower nearby. And in general, apparel is really the only type of protection uh, that you can that you can buy for your body that that provides that type of protection. So I do offer apparel. There's the uh, mo right now mostly for the head, although also the the underwear, um, and then the uh, bed canopy, which I understand it is it is not an inexpensive uh, product, um, but I I intentionally added that to the catalog uh, last year. Um, as people were more and more and more worried about new towers going up in their area, particularly 5G towers. And I was thinking to myself, what's, what's a solution that I can provide? Because the, the, the option, right, uh, of course you could move, but you have to pick a place to move to that also doesn't have cell towers. Um, so the option is, is residential scale shielding, like shielding your walls and your windows and everything in your house. And that's incredibly expensive, incredibly difficult. Um, and Kathy, who I see joined the, the webinar, um, gave, a, gave, gave a great webinar a couple months ago on that, that particular topic. But anyway, uh, so that's why I added the canopy because yes, it, it can't protect you all the time everywhere you go, but it can protect you all night while you sleep. And um, so, so that's as good an answer as I can uh, give you, Claire. Um, there are other shielding companies out there, uh, some reputable ones that offer different products that you know do some different things that I don't do. So for instance, I don't make a cell phone case. I intentionally don't make a cell phone case because I don't want any product that encourages people to think even a little bit that it's okay to hold a phone up to their head. Um, but. I don't make a cell phone case. There are some legitimate companies out there that make an EMF shielded cell phone case. So it depends what you're trying to shield against. Um, uh, that, that, that really answers that question. Thank you, Claire. Um, oh, Peter Sirk is here. Hi, Peter. I saw your talk at, at the conference. It was fantastic. Um, I'm not quite sure uh, the, the Germany building biologists have tested, have had testing conducted mid different material. Um, I've actually translated a summary and created a PowerPoint. Um, it sounds interesting for everyone who doesn't know, Peter is a, uh, a building biologist. He gave a talk at uh, the uh, EMF medical conference a couple months ago on testing. He went over all these meters and how to test in different parts of your house. It was, it was a really fantastic talk. Peter, if you'd like to to paste that link into the chat pod if it's available. I think that would be fantastic. Thank you. Oh, okay. Sorry, I'm getting now to a later question. Peter is referring to millimeter waves up to 40 gigahertz. So there you go. Yeah, if, if, if that link is available, please paste it into the chat pod uh, or email me and we can figure out a way to get it out to the website. Thank you. Okay, let's see. Ah, Denise. My husband refuses to turn off his cell phone. Is there a product he can use that will allow him to leave it on but not have it reflect out at me when I walk with him? Well, yes, there are products like that, but you also, right, so I, I should have gotten one of my phone pouches out maybe for illustration purposes, but let's just say, for example, he chooses to use his, uh, a phone pouch uh, while, he, while you're walking. Um, or actually, hold on one second. There is something I'm going to show. I have one handy. Hold on. Uh, 
Um, this is, oh, can we see it? It's, uh, Zoom is, is wiping it out there. It's the new SYB sling bag. And the back of the bag is shielded, the front is not. It's designed for carrying electronics while still allowing them to communicate if that's what you would like to do. And so let's say your husband was walking and carrying the sling bag and his phone was in the sling bag. So he's, 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 a, he's, he's safer because some of the radiation, a lot of the radiation is being deflected in the other direction. I always am very careful. Uh, we never say my, you know, my, our products make things safe. They make them safer. Um, but that means the radiation, right? It's being deflected away from him behind his back. And so if you're concerned about your exposure uh, from, from that, you wanna make sure that you're not behind him in any way, right? So you ask, you know, could, could he use a product that, make, that, that makes it safer for him without deflecting the radiation to you? That would then depend on your position relative to him. And this is, I apologize for getting a little complicated. I wish I could just say, yes, do X and you're fine, but that's not how shielding works. Um, you always need to consider how the product is designed to be used in order to make sure to use it effectively. I hope I answered that um, for you, Denise. Thank you. Paula asks, what shielding do you recommend for smart meters? You know, um, I would use the criteria. So I don't, I don't make a product for smart meters per se. Some people use my poster frame liner for that purpose. And I have, um, Stephanie, maybe if you can post the, um, the link to the blog post about uh, how, to, how, how to use that product. But you basically, you put that on the wall inside opposite the, the smart meter and it can, it can bounce the uh, uh, radiation away from, from, your, from your building. But the, the point is any product, right? The, the framework I, I tried to give you tonight here any product that, that meets that frame, so that that works, that's designed for that purpose, right? That you can use that um, to help reduce your exposure from smart meter. And a lot of people uh, are worried about smart meters. You know, sometimes you can actually get them removed. Sometimes you have to pay a fee for that, but you can get them removed. Um, that would be the, you know, remember I said the best EMF protection is eliminating your exposure in the first place. That That is optimal, if you can do that, that's how I'd say protect against the smart meter. But if you can't, then shielding, EMF shielding can definitely work to help protect you from those exposures. Um, and I would recommend using the framework that I, that I tried giving the delivery here um, uh, to, to help pick. Again, I don't recommend, I mean, obviously I recommend my own products. <laughs> I would be lying if I said I didn't. I'd also be a bad business person. But I'm not. I, beyond SYB, uh, I, I don't recommend specific um, specific brands. Okay. John asks if I have other informational videos about EMF. Well, John, <laughs> yes, I do. Um, let me paste. Here we go. Yes, I do. I'm going to paste the uh, link here into the chat pod and it's our YouTube channel. It's youtube.com slash shield your body. And we have a growing library of video content there. Uh, a lot of it with uh, education. Also, this is where all the webinars we do, where the archives of those webinars are posted. But I also do other videos just on specific topics uh, like, uh, like dirty electricity, uh, like solar power, like health effects on children. You know, there's, there's a whole library. So thank you for asking that question. Uh, I really would love it if everyone on this webinar went and subscribed and watched all those videos. Thank you. Anonymous attendee asked, do I sell a home EMF tester that is a three in one type? I do not, I do not sell meters. Um, I view it sort of as a conflict of interest to sell shielding and then sell a meter because then people might accuse me of uh, designing the meter to make my, I don't know, I guess it's silly maybe, but um, there, there, are, there are already so many good meters out there. Uh, and in terms of the three in one, those are the, the two I mentioned earlier, which is the Trifield TF2 and the Cornet ED88T plus. Those are the two of the three in one meters that I recommend. They're both about $160. So, you know, not cheap, 
but I'd say reasonably priced, certainly, you know, the, not the most act, not the most accurate that you can get, but for the price, the value I think is fantastic. Amy asked, do you have to ground the canopy? The answer is no. Um, I don't wanna get into more detail on that in this webinar because it gets a little technical. Uh, we, uh, Kathy actually, I think, addressed that on uh, another webinar a few months ago, uh, but um, I should probably make sure we, we get a write-up on the blog explaining why, um, but it has to do, uh, a, a large part of it has to do with dirty electricity, and um, I will try to get more content out there. But no, you do not need to ground the canopy. You can if you choose to. We recommend against it if you're grounding into an outlet, uh, but you can. You can get one of those alligator clip grounds. Uh, and attach it to the canopy and then plug it into a wall. But we do not uh, recommend that in general, um, unless you can ground straight into the earth. And even then there's all of these issues on the EMF. Um, there's so many questions that don't have quick and easy answers, but um, yeah, you do not need to ground the canopy. That is a quick and easy answer. Thank you. Okay. Um, anonymous attendee asks, do, uh, does a microwave emit in any direction or just one direction? So it's the same as I, I think one of the earlier questions I answered, EMF goes in every direction uh, with a few minor, very specific exceptions. Any device that emits EMF is emitting it in every direction. Also with microwaves, I, I wanna, I mean, I, I think if you're, if you're watching this webinar, you know that microwaves are dangerous. Um, but I wanna emphasize, right? Because a microwave oven uses microwave radiation to cook food. So it's like cell phone radiation, except such high power that it can actually cook the food. And that can leak out. It, in fact, it doesn't can leak out. It does leak out. And, um, and that will leak in every direction. So that itself is, is a risk uh, to your health. But in order to generate microwaves with that power, the microwave oven has a power source that is so powerful that it's also emitting massive levels of uh, extremely low frequency or ELF radiation. And so um, uh, it is a multiple, when you're using a microwave oven, it is a, multi, a source of multiple high powered exposures simultaneously. And I really recommend, if you're gonna use a microwave, you know, turn it on and get out of Dodge and uh, come back when, when it's done. Okay. Beverly asks, are all new modems by at t 4G or 5G or both? I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I would like to tell you, I, I don't know the answer. Um, I would say that um, Fewer things are 5G yet than people think, uh, but 5G is, is out there, right? So more and more things are 5G enabled, um, but uh, I don't know the answer to that question. Oh, well, uh, sorry. I, and I also don't know what you particularly mean by modem there, but I will say almost nothing is purely 5G. Uh, so if something is 5G, it is also 4G and probably also 3G, right? Because these 5G networks, they're, they're just not strong enough yet. They're not pervasive enough yet. You can't rely on 5G yet. And so uh, nothing is purely 5G. If you're getting a phone and it's 5G, um, then, then um, uh, it also has 4G and 3G. Uh, so yeah, it'll have multi. Now, oh, Kathy just posted in there. Oh, so the question might have been about Wi-Fi. Okay, I thank you, Kathy. So, um, Kathy is talking. So, in the, okay. So, Kathy points out that almost all new Wi-Fi routers and modems use both 2.4 gigahertz and 5.8 gigahertz. And I know that on these Wi-Fi modems, uh, the 5.8 gigahertz is often referred to by people as 5G. That is not 5G. So if you're getting a, a Wi-Fi router that has um, a 5G network on it, that is not 5G, that's a five gigahertz uh, Wi-Fi network. Uh, I'll also say on a lot of these routers, you can disable one of those networks. So even if you get a dual band router, 
um, that has these two networks on them, you can log into the router and turn off one of them. So to, to reduce your exposure. Thank you. Okay, Anonymous asks, does using your film type shielding on a phone work as well as the pouch? So I don't make a film type shielding. Um, and so the answer, uh, no. Um, I, I mean, I get, hmm. I don't know exactly what product you're talking about. Uh, maybe, maybe I'm misunderstanding. When I, when I hear film, I think of something that's clear and I don't make any clear shielding. Um, I have thought about trying to do something like that, right? So something that you could cover the front of your phone with. And so when you're, you're holding it up and you're looking at it and using it, that you're protected. The problem is to the best of my knowledge, the technology does not exist that you can shield the front of a phone and have it EMF shielded and also have the touchscreen work, right? Because in order for that to happen, the material needs to be clear. It needs to be uh, EMF shielded and it needs to be electroconductive, right? Because that's how these touch screens work. And there are materials that are electro EMF shielding and electroconductive, but not clear. And there are materials that are um, clear and EMF shielded, but not electroconductive. So you can't you can't do the front of the phone. Um, thank you. Paula asks, in your testing, have you used muscle testing or other diagnostic machines to see how a product affects an individual person's body? The answer to that is no. Um, I'd be interested in it. It's something uh, that I've, I've thought about at times. I mean, that's not the kind of thing that you do in a lab. So you really, at that point, are talking about commissioning a study of some kind, which needs to be designed and then execute. The costs go significantly up. Um, if you're just going to do it on one person, that's, that's not statistically significant uh, information. So it, it becomes a very complex and expensive sort of endeavor. Um, I, it, it is something I'm considering. It is not something we have done. And it's not something I've seen any other EMF shielding company do either. Um, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. I just haven't seen it. Um, but that is, that is a really good question. Thank you, Paula. Emma asks, any supplements to help your body and brain from EMFs absorb to due to exposure? Um, well, we're, I'm not gonna recommend any specific supplements. I am not a nutritionist. Uh, fortunately, Kathy is. Uh, <laughs> so um, I would actually encourage you to, uh, in fact, while well, this is a great opportunity to do this, I am going to um, publish right now. So if you go to um, this URL, I just pasted it in the chat pod at shieldyourbody.com slash webinar. You can register for the May 1st uh, webinar, uh, which will be given by Kathy and is all about EMF and nutrition. And it is, uh, she will actually be, so that was a, that was a perfectly well timed question, Emma, in terms of allowing me the opportunity to promote the next webinar. Um, but the, the answer is yes, there's, there's a lot of levers you can pull uh, through nutrition to increase your resilience against damage from EMF. And Kathy uh, will be talking about that. Uh, yeah, Kathy paid you to ask that, she says. Uh, Kathy will be uh, giving a great presentation on that on May 1st. So you can register for that webinar right now. Uh, that, that page is live. Thank you, Emma. OK, so Anonymous asks, how does your laptop shield RF if the pad is underneath the laptop and not completely encased? So. Uh, this is this one's a little bit easier to explain in writing, but I will try to do it verbally. So the laptop pad is designed. Okay, so this is an example again of how the best EMF mitigation practices don't involve shielding products like my laptop pad. So you keep the laptop pad far away from you. For example, you use like I'm using here. I use an external keyboard. So my laptop pad when I'm working most of the time. I'm sorry, my laptop when I'm working most of the time. It's, it's a couple of feet away from me. And that is uh, the safer way to use a laptop. The issue comes when you use the laptop, uh, the laptop closer to you or especially on 
your lap, which a lot of people do. I strongly advise against it, but a lot of people do. And sometimes it is not avoidable. For example, when if you're on public transit, if you're on a plane, if you're working on your couch at home, which a lot of people in the past year have had to turn their couch into an office, right? There's a, so in that instance, the laptop is so close to your body that you need uh, a shield between the laptop and your body. Now you are correct. You are not fully encasing your laptop. You cannot, right? Because how could you? How could you type on it if you were fully in, in, encasing it? How could you see the monitor if you were fully encasing it? So in that instance, full uh, of, of fully enclosing the the EMF emitting device wouldn't uh, isn't feasible. It's just not feasible. So a product like my laptop pad or any laptop EMF shield from any company, right? The premise is that you are deflecting the radiation away from your body where it is closest to your body. Because uh, as I said during the talk, right? The, the distance between your body and the source of the EMF makes a huge difference. So uh, when, when the laptop is right up against your lap, um, it's a direct full power hit. And it's also uh, in a part of your body that is pretty sensitive to damage, particularly, but not only on men. And so that is the premise of a product like my laptop pad. And like I say, that is a use case where there is no practical full enclosure alternative. Um, it's, uh, it's, just, it, it, it's just not possible, right? It, because you, you couldn't fully enclose a laptop and still type on it. You couldn't fully enclose a laptop and still see the monitor. And you couldn't fully enclose the laptop and still use Wi-Fi, um, and so that, that 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 is that is that is why the laptop pad exists. So thank you, anonymous attendee. Denise asks, "How do you wash your shielding cloth? How many washes will it last?" So, great question. Uh, the care instructions for um, in general. I, I assume you're talking about the apparel because that's the only that's the only part of my catalog that's designed to be washed. Um, and, and the canopy, sorry, the, the apparel and the canopy. Um, each product has its own set of instructions, but in general, it boils down to uh, machine wash cold or hand wash cold and then air dry. And so you hang dry it. You don't, you don't put it through the machine. You don't rain dry it. You never dry clean it. Uh, how many washes does it last? It, uh, you know, there's, it's hard to do full, um, you know, because how, how do you keep doing? I mean, so for instance, the pocket patch has been wash tested 30 times without any loss in performance. Um, but we, we don't have that precise number for every product, um, but it lasts. If you care for it properly, it lasts a long time. And as you'll note, you know, I give a lifetime warranty on my products that includes the apparel. So, you know, if, 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 you know, if you cut open your, your underwear with a knife by accident, you know, that isn't under warranty. But if you've taken care of it and for whatever reason stops working, um, that is under warranty. So I stand by my products um, pretty, pretty strongly by offering that warranty. Um, as I say, you know, we, we've washed it and multiple times and done testing ourselves. The only product that has been lab tested, uh, lab wash tested, is the pocket patch. And that was up to 30 times with no loss in performance. James asks, can I quickly summarize the shielding technology of your clothing, material technology, et cetera? I've not studied your site in detail. Sure thing, James, I will try. So it's uh, all, all of my products, well, the headsets are a little different. But all of my products that aren't headsets are based, uh, use the same type of technology. It's the same type of technology that uh, was invented almost 200 years ago by Michael Faraday when he created the Faraday cage. And, and basically the, the premise is if you take a conductive metallic material and you weave it into a certain pattern of mesh, right? <laughs> Which I'm trying to demonstrate with my hands, but you weave it into a, a certain pattern of mesh, um, then uh, then it deflects certain frequencies of, of EMF radiation. And actually, while I'm answering this, I want to pull up a post. I'm trying to pull up a post. Um, 
here we go. Sorry, I have a list of all my posts here. Um, this post goes, uh, so James, that, that link is for you that I just pasted into the chat pod. Uh, this post goes into detail on different types of materials. So I said conductive metallic materials. And certain ones are, are known to be more effective. So you mentioned apparel. In all of my apparel products, that conductive uh, metal is silver. And I use silver because it is inert against your body, right? Apparel, you're in, you're in contact with it a lot. And so we, we use an inert material, silver. It also has some other advantages. It's, anti uh, it's known to be antimicrobial, anti-odor. So all of my apparel uses silver. But silver is obviously very expensive. So in a product that doesn't require constant or frequent or even any contact against your skin, we don't use that. We generally use an alloy made of copper and nickel. And so that's, for instance, in my foam pouch or the, that, uh, that bag that I showed you guys earlier, this bag, uh, the, the rear is lined with a material that's, uh, that's copper nickel. So, um, so that is the, the technology that we use in all of the products. And as I say, in the apparel, it is uh, silver because again, because it's hypoallergenic and has some other benefits as well. Uh, great question, thank you. Amy asked the best product for air travel. Uh, in my opinion, that would be a sleeping pill, but I think you're talking about EMF protection. So um, that would be an example earlier in this talk I mentioned, you know, if you're protecting against your phone, you could use a phone pouch. If you're protecting against your laptop, you could use a laptop pad. Um, but I said, you know, if you're trying to protect against radiation from a cell tower or a neighbor's Wi-Fi network or something like that, you know, you need to use apparel. Uh, and that is, the airplane is the same sort of situation where the, the, the sources are all around you and out of your uh, direct control. And so apparel, anything that covers your body. The product I have that people tell me most they use for airplanes is my baby blanket. Um, so they wrap it around parts of their body and um, that is the protection they'll use in an airplane. Um, so that's a great question. Thank you, Amy. Anonymous attendee asks the full time, the RV move, nomad movement is significantly growing. Many use solar arrays with inverter, dirty electricity. Uh, any way to know what inverters are better than others? So this is where I am going to, oh, it is not in my spreadsheet. Um, give me one second. I, oh, I have it here on this page. Give me a second. It is, here we go. So I'm not gonna answer that question here. Um, it's a little off topic, but it's a great question. And Kathy answered it a couple of months ago and um, in this webinar. So I just pasted the webinar uh, to the uh, chat pod. Um, and, uh, and by the way, all these webinar archives on my website, they are pasted along with a, uh, a transcription in the page. So you can search in the page for a term that you're looking for, see roughly where in the transcript it happened, then use that to jump in the video uh, to, to what you're looking for. So thank you. Beverly asks, what clothing do you recommend most highly? I would guess headgear. I mean, so in general, I mean, look, your whole body is important, um, but in general, it is the, um, you know, the brain and the gonads um, are, are two very important uh, parts of your body in terms of your ability to function and A, your ability to reproduce and B, the quality of the health of, of offspring. I apologize if that was, if, if that was a, a little, um, uh, uh, oh, I'm losing the word. If that was uh, just, if that was a little too uh, distant terminology. And so, you know, you want to give birth to healthy kids is I guess what I'm saying. So your brain and your gonads. And so that's why, for example, in apparel, um, uh, I focused first on underwear and then second on the head. Um, but any, you know, it depends what part of your body you care most or, or not you care most about, but that you're, you're most concerned about protecting. 
Um, some people, for instance, so, you know, I, I mentioned the head um, and, you know, the, I have the bandana, I have the neck gaiter, the neck gaiter is good for the head, but the neck gaiter is also really good for the thyroid. And increasingly, uh, people are worried about the rise in thyroid uh, cancer um, and the links to EMF exposure. So, you know, that's not the brain. Um, but some, pe you know, some people want to protect against uh, protect their thyroid. Other people might have different organs they want to protect. Some people may have uh, pain uh, from EMF exposure. Let's say leg pain. So, you know, even though their brain is pretty important, the, the, their body is telling them the, the immediate issue is the leg, and so that's what they want to protect. So it all depends on what you want to protect. Um, and uh, like I say just in terms of addressing as broad a market as possible with limited resources. We started with underwear, we moved on to the head and now neck, both the bandana actually and the, the neck gator can do both of those. And we're constantly thinking of what, you know, what we can do next. Um, but it's all about what you wanna protect. Thank you, Beverly. Okay. Um, Anonymous attendee asks, working digitally on computer through Wi-Fi in a tin can RV seems to pose particularly high risks. Any thoughts on shielding? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. Um, and it's not an easy or quick one to answer. Um, uh, what you could do, so yes, I mean, the answer is yes, that is, that is something you should uh, think about, especially because um, RVs can have some significant issues with dirty electricity. Uh, in addition to, you know, like you say, it's a tin can, so anything kind of on the inside is bouncing around on the inside. Um, I will note that tonight's discount code is also valid on consulting. So if you wanted to book time with Kathy, who, who is uh, here in the chat pod, but uh, she's available. Um, she is a uh, certified building biologist. She is an electro -mag uh, electromagnetic radiation specialist. Um, and uh, she has a lot of experience working on uh, this type of mitigation. Uh, I, I'd encourage that. Beyond that, it, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to give you uh, an answer that unfortunately that would be immediately actionable for you. Um, I guess one thing I can say that is immediately actionable if you're not already doing it is kill the power when you're not using the power. Uh, and I don't mean just unplug, right? I mean, like kill the power that's going to all the outlets. Uh, if you're not using it, turn that stuff, on, turn off the circuits going there and that will make a big difference. Um, so at least I was able, I, you know, I hope to give you something actionable that you can do right now to, to improve that. Uh, but it is a great question, and it's just not a quick or easy one to answer. Thank you. So Paula asks, what's the difference between a phone pouch and a phone case? Very great question. Um, I should have gotten my phone pouch. I need to just start having some products handy during these webinars. A phone pouch, it's, it's specifically designed to make it safer to carry your phone. So when the phone is in the pouch, you can't really use your phone. I mean, if you have headphones plugged into it, you can like listen to stuff on it and, and have a call, but you can't like use the screen. You can't, you can't hold it up to your head, which you never do, but you can't hold it up to your head and talk on it, right? It's in a pouch and the pouch is designed to be carried. A case is a case, right? Just like any other phone case, except it's, it's EMF shielded. So it, it doesn't, it's not designed to just be in your pocket or on your belt or wherever it is. It's designed to be on your phone at all times. And a lot of these are marketed with photos with the, the person using it, holding the phone up to their head, which again, you can't do in my phone pouch. It, it's, it's, it's literally an impossibility. It wouldn't, you wouldn't use it that way. So the, those are the, that's the, the pouch is like a, a little tiny bag that's just for your phone that you carry. A case is a case. I hope I did a decent job answering that. Thank you. That was a good question. I'm sorry, I need, I need a sip of water here, one sec. Uh, every time I look at the questions pod, there's more of them, no matter how many I answer. <laughs> um, 
let's see. Julia asks, if you put your phone on airplane mode, does that cut off all the EMF radiation or do I have to turn it off entirely? You know, technically it doesn't cut off all the radiation, but it cuts out so, so, so much of it that, I mean, it makes such a huge difference. I mean, if you can turn off your phone entirely, you know, turn off your phone entirely. But airplane mode, I mean, it really, well, A, it'll cut out basic, it'll cut out, to my knowledge, it'll cut out all of the radio frequency microwave radiation. Uh, if you make sure to turn off everything, right? So if, if you turn into airplane mode, it should do that, but it depends on some of the other settings you might have on your phone. So, right, because you can go into airplane mode, but still have Wi-Fi on. You don't want that. You could go into airplane mode, still have Bluetooth on. You don't want that. Um, so you want to go into airplane mode, but make sure everything is turned off. Then all of the radio frequency emissions will be gone. Um, there, you know, because it's, it's a battery, it's a powered device, uh, just by having it on, there is going to be a very, 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 very low level of emissions from, from just the, the circuitry, but it is super low. Like you wouldn't even be able to measure it with a consumer grade meter like the kind I cover in the ebook. So uh, I am a big advocate of airplane mode. Um, I think it is a, it, it, you just keep your phone in airplane mode unless you need it on. Um, so I hope that answered your question. Uh, in general, I, I like to tell people it cuts out all the EMF because it cuts out so much. It's basically like cutting all of it out. But at a most technical level, it doesn't technically cut out all of it, just almost all of it. So do your download books cover topic, how much we need to be concerned about neighbor's Wi-Fi based on what level we test it to be? Yeah, so the testing ebook includes um, recommended safety levels from multiple organizations, including the Building Biology Institute, uh, which is the most conservative set of uh, safety limits included in the book. Um, so yeah, don't, don't worry so much about whether it's your neighbor's Wi-Fi or nearby cell tower you know, take the measurements, see what the levels are. That's what should be the thing you focus on. What are the levels? Are, are they uh, uh, satisfactory or are they something you feel you need to take action on? That, so great question. And yes, the, the ebook does include those. So Jill asked, does the bed canopy protect from dirty electricity? Another one of these EMF questions that um, doesn't have a clean answer. Um, so first off, the bed canopy so far has only been tested on radio frequency fields. So we have not yet performed lab tests and that's all we market really is, is the, uh, the radio frequency fields. Um, so we don't yet have lab data to show you that it, it shields a certain amount of magnetic radiation or a certain amount of electric radiation. Um, and none of my products do. And I actually haven't seen uh, any, any shielding products that, that have, have that type of lab testing behind it. Not yet anyway, maybe that's where it's going. Now, when you talk about dirty electricity and I have a couple of experts um, in the chat room, so I better be very conservative and careful with what I say. Um, and they'll be able to correct me on specific numbers, but um, it, it exists, it, it, it is composed of, of two, two, basically two types of components. And some people really, anyway, the point is uh, their dirty electricity, like the kind Kathy discussed in her solar power webinar, which comes from uh, uh, power inverters and motors and on electrical appliances, it comes from dimmer switches and it, it pollutes the low frequency uh, emissions, uh, sorry, current on, on, on your circuitry, which leads to emissions. Um, that are irregular and aren't, aren't clean. That's where it comes. But dirty electricity, to my mind, and, and not only me, other people, but not universally, also includes stray radio frequencies or RF transients. So, uh, you know, because the whole power grid is, is an antenna. And as, you know, as the, the wires go through neighborhoods, passes by cell towers, it passes by Wi-Fi networks, all this stuff gets picked up to varying degrees and carry certain distances and so forth. So the way I view dirty electricity is that it is composed both of these 
uh, voltage transients, which I, I said at first, and RF transients, which I, I just described. I do not have lab testing on the voltage transients, um, but the RF transients uh, would, would fall under the same sort of um, frequencies that are tested in the lab. Uh, I only test certain frequencies, as I said in, in the deciphering claims part here, you know, no shielding product tests every single frequency. Um, th th there's just too many of them. So, but it, it, I test a lot of the common frequencies and it shows that there's pretty consistent level of shielding effectiveness in the wireless communication uh, segment of, of, of the spectrum. So I hope, I, again, I said it wasn't gonna be a clean answer. So I hope I, I answered it um, satisfactorily. Thank you. It is a great question, Joel. Um, uh, and I hope I, I answered it to your satisfaction. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry, I need another. I'm losing my voice. Okay. Claire asks, what is SYB's best modem router blocker? Mine is too tall and long for the picture frame, for instance. Yep, Stephanie has been telling me that I, I need a bigger picture frame. Uh, but it is just it's a it's a diff, it's a difficult product to ship because of its size and shape. Uh, so making it bigger would make it even more difficult. Um, so if the picture frame doesn't work for your router, then you know I don't really have a product specifically for your Wi-Fi router. Um, uh, 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 it depends where it's located. If it's, it's in a, if it's in an, its own room or a different room from where you're located, you could, you could consider the poster frame liner on the wall. Um, um, but that is, uh, that, yeah, I don't have, I, in terms of the Wi-Fi router specifically, the, the picture frame really is the product, uh, that's, that I have that's best suited for that. And if, if your router is too large for that, um, then, then, yeah, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't really have a product for that. Thank you, Claire. Okay. Sorry, I'm just scanning here. Okay, Bill asks, a bed canopy seems like it would be a major dust magnet. How often can they be cleaned? What is the process for doing so? Um, how difficult is it to put up and take down the canopy? Is it one size fits all? Great question. So, okay, is it one size fits all? No, that I can answer very quickly and easily. Um, right now we have two sizes. We have a twin and a king. So a lot of people who have queen size beds, for example, they'll, they'll get the king. Uh, so we have a twin and, and a king. Uh, in terms of care, it is machine washable. Um, but like, like the other, uh, someone asked about cleaning apparel earlier. Um, so it's machine washable. You want to do it on cold and you want to air dry it. Um, you should be able to wash it as much as you'd like, as long as you do it properly. Um, now there was another part of that question. How difficult is it to put up and take down? So um, do we have... So it basically, the, the top of the canopy has six hoops, fabric hoops, right? So the, can, the, the type of canopy I make and sell, it has no frame, right? So it's, it's really just a net. Uh, it also has floor mats, uh, but it, the canopy itself is just a net. And uh, the top of the net has six hoops, um, three on both sides. And you just hang, you, you put some hooks into the ceiling and you hang, you hang each hoop from a hook. So, I mean, you, you have to get up there and, and take it off the hook, but that's it. And so it, it's not like construction or, or anything like that. Um, you, just, uh, you just need to take it off the hook and put it into the wash. Again, um, cold water and air dry it. I hope I answered that question. Thank you, Bill. Okay. So anonymous asks, how does someone test my products at home? Uh, that ebook, that here, I'm gonna type it into the chat pod again. 
So this ebook that you can get at shieldyourbody.com slash test, that explains how. Um, you'll need a meter. I recommend some meters in that ebook. Uh, but um, uh, when, once you have the meter, that book uh, has all the instructions on how to do that. Thank you. Okay, so Claire asks the flex, she, okay, she was clarifying the earlier question about the film, the uh, EMF shielding film. She was asking about the flex shield. Um, so yes, you can use the, you can cut the flex shield and use it uh, for shielding in all sorts of different locations. I strongly advise not to apply the flex shield to any electronics directly. It's really designed for surfaces like a wall or a desk. Um, you can put it like if you have a, a phone case and you want to put it somewhere in that case, you can do that too. Uh, but don't apply it directly to any electronics. Um, it is it is a very strong adhesive. It is a permanent adhesive. So you don't really you just don't want to put that on electronics. But other than that, yes, you can use the Flex Shield uh, to to create shielding solutions um, on all sorts of different types of surfaces. Uh, let's see. Okay. Louise asks, I have four smart meters on the outside wall of the bedroom. I used a tri-field to measure the EMF. There was zero RF, but the magnetic EMFs were off the chart. Can you please interpret this result? Uh, also, as I moved away from the wall, the reading fell off dramatically and there were no EMFs where my bed is. Does that mean that I am safe in, in my bed? Okay. Four smart meters outside the wall, but no RF. Um, so that, the first thing I would think when I see that is because different types of, there's no single standard for smart meters. There, there's a lot of different standards and some are communicating, you know, multiple times a minute and some don't communicate for, I, I guess I don't know the longest interval, but let's say an hour, right? So it'll send one signal every hour. And so if you're really picking up zero RF from a smart meter, my guess is it wasn't actually transmitting at that time. And so you'd want to take measurements over a longer period of time or try it at different times of the day or something like that to see if it's really at zero, because it seems unlikely to me that it would really be at zero uh, all the time. Now, the magnetic uh, does not surprise me. And this is something people, you know, because people, they hear about smart meters and they hear people like me say, you know, they're a health risk. And, and, but that's the first time they've thought of a power meter as a health risk. Um, the only thing smart meters do that, you know, dumb meters don't is the radio frequency transmissions, the wireless communication. Um, other types of dumb meters, they still have very, they can have very high magnetic fields. Uh, I just recently measured uh, the magnetic fields off of my a uh, circuit breaker in my house. And I was getting, you know, massive magnetic fields uh, off of that. And Kathy told me that that's very common. So all of these meters, whether they're smart or dumb, are, it's not surprising to me that they have high magnetic fields. It's also not surprising to me that you say they dropped off considerably by the time you got to your bed. So, um, you know, if there's really no readings, no detectable levels at your bed, you know, the bed is, is should EMF levels, pardon me, EMF exposure at the bed should not be a particular concern for you. The one thing I would say though, is reiterate my start of the question, which is if you're really getting zero RF readings off of the smart meter, my guess is it just wasn't transmitting when you tested and you should test more times um, and see uh, what it, if, if it's really zero all the time. But I mean, if it's zero, then that's obviously not a worrying level of exposure. Thank you, Luis. Okay. Jumping through the list. This list does not get shorter. <laughs> Julie asks, doesn't your laptop pad direct the radiation towards your body? since it's deflected from your lap. Um, so there's two parts to that answer. One is, you know, not really unless you're hovering over, right? But so it would, it does direct more to your hand. Yes, it does, that, that's for sure. 
Um, again, this is how all EMF laptop shields work, including my laptop pad. Uh, so yes, your hands will get more exposure. To the rest of your body, you know, again, not, not, not so much unless you're, you're really leaning over it, but there's the other part of this, right? Which is the power of EMF radiation diminishes exponentially with distance. So the, you know, if the laptop is in your lap, the exposure you're deflecting away from your lap is a much higher power than the exposure that you would be getting uh, towards your head. Because you're talking about a distance of zero versus a distance of feet, multiple feet. And so again, again you know, I want to reiterate, the safest way to use a laptop is not in your lap. Uh, you should net, but the laptop pad is designed for, for people who do. And, um, and even I do it sometimes, I use my laptop, uh, my laptop in my lap. Not often, I really try not to, but you know, there's times I'm, I'm in the back of a car and I gotta get some work done. Um, is, or uh, I, had to, I had to get out of my house uh, the other day and I had to work in my backyard. I, I, I just really needed to get work done and the house was unavailable for a couple of hours. And um, you know, I don't have a desk in my backyard. So those, I, so in general, I don't use my laptop pad, uh, but there are times when I use my laptop pad. So I hope, um, I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Julia. Can the pouch be washed? No, um, it can be. It can be like hand washed, like not washed. It can be hand cleaned with like a rag or something. Um, it is not a, a washable product. You can't throw it in the wash. Thank you, Alicia. Claire asks, even though you don't want to go into products that require grounding, are you saying that any product that requires just a ground plug, like grounding sheets, could actually be emitting dirty electricity? Um, is there something like an EMF measuring device that one can use at home to check for dirty electricity? Okay, so again, yes, you're right. I'm not going to go into detail on that, but uh, the short answer is yes. Um, you know, once you ground a product, let's say grounding sheets, use the example of grounding sheets. Um, uh, if you're going to plug that into the wall, that is a bi-directional connection, right? It's not just going to take your discharged energy from your body, go through the sheet and deposit it in the wall. You've created a bi-directional connection. So any junk that is on the circuitry in your house will then be conducted through the ground to whatever your grounding product is. Now, I will be totally clear, there is debate on this point. No one is quite sure how this plays out in practice. EMF is super complicated. I've been on calls where there are people who are far more educated than I am uh, in pitched heated debate on this very question. My view is that there is more than sufficient doubt that this is possible, uh, that I shy away from grounding products, unless you can ground into a very clean earth. Um, and when I say earth, I mean literally the earth and in an area without stray voltage running around and stuff like that, straight ground currents. So the short answer to your question is yes, I do believe, I, I have not seen it proven definitively, but I have seen uh, I'm not the only one who, who has these concerns. And I will say it makes complete intuitive sense to me that this is how it would work, um, that, this, that that is a byproduct of using grounded products into a grounded circuit in your house. So that is why we do not recommend grounding the bed canopy. That is why I do not sell any grounded grounding products at all. Um, even though we almost, I, I actually went through the whole development process uh, a couple of years ago on a grounded yoga mat that I was going to be my first grounding product. And that was, it was in the process of, of, um, of prepping to release that product that I came across all of this information about, about the potential for, for harmful currents being uh, conducted to the grounded grounding product itself. And I was like, I, I'm just gonna, I'm not going to touch this. So I hope that answered the question. There. Uh, the, the, you did ask one other though, um, and I'm going to give you a link in the chat pod. 
uh, which is shieldyourbody.com slash dirty dash electricity. And that is a post on dirty electricity. And that has links to two different dirty electricity meters that you can purchase. One is called the Stetzer um, and the other is called Green Wave. And I think they're both about $120, $130. You only need one, you don't need both. Um, and uh, yeah, so yes, you can measure dirty electricity. On, a, on, a, on an outlet, um, not on a grounding product, not yet. Not that I'm, I'm not easily, not, there's not a meter that makes it easy to do that. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's see. Julia asked, does wearing a sterling silver bracelet or necklace help protect against EMF? Um, you know, I haven't seen any data just to, to say that that would. And I don't see any intuitive reason why that would provide protection. Uh, but again, use the frame. The reason I tried, I gave the framework that I, I did in tonight's talk is, is in the hopes that, you know, cause I don't know which, which company you're talking about when you ask that. Um, so I don't know what information they're presenting. So what I, try, what I gave you tonight is an attempt uh, at giving you a framework to help you look at, you know, the claims that you're seeing. and. Based on that, do you think that this product that you're evaluating might help you? But I will. I haven't seen any any anything about you know a, a silver bracelet that that would provide you know any meaningful protection. Thank you. Bill asks, "What? Aha, great question. What distance would be considered safe as getting out of Dodge when microwave oven is in use?" Um, I realize there's no one answer for all microwaves. So that's correct. I mean, the answer is as far away as you can. You know, if you're in an apartment, there's only a certain distance you're gonna be able to get away, but get that far away, go into another room. You know, um, these things really are very high powered. I mean, really high, the microwave ovens have a tremendous amount of power. I mean, I know people like us, you know, like me and uh, Kathy on the call and, um, uh, you know, we, we, we advise against all sorts of like, oh, Wi-Fi routers, you gotta be careful with those. Cell phones, you gotta be careful with those. Microwave ovens are super high powered. Like they blow a Wi-Fi router away. Um, Wi-Fi routers do not require the amount of power that a microwave oven does uh, because A, they don't emit powerful enough microwaves to cook food or tissue or anything like that. And B, they don't require the uh, power source sufficient to generate microwave energy at that power. So uh, these are super, I mean, I'm trying to, to, to really express really, these, these are like order of magnitude difference between like a Wi-Fi router and a microwave oven. So as far away as you can possibly be. Now, the, the best thing to do, I mean, if you're really trying to answer that question for yourself is, um, is to have a meter and, and to test. Uh, you know, when the microwave oven is on, how far away do I have to get in order to get, you know, readings that are like, similar to when the microwave oven isn't on? Uh, I, I guarantee you it'll, it'll be further than, than, than you think. And Kathy just pasted into the chat pod uh, that uh, her meters pick up um, microwave ovens from her neighbors. And Kathy, Kathy lives in a house, not, not in an apartment. So, um, Thank you, Bill. That great question, by the way. Uh, ah, Sarah. Oh, I love this question. I haven't had this question in years. Uh, can you get through metal detectors in the clothing? Yes, you can. Um, <laughs> so actually, the only time I've ever had an issue go. So a metal detectors aren't aren't an issue. So you're going to be fine. The 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 thing this reminds me of is uh, body scanners and, and airport security scanners. So the only time I've ever had an issue with my products going through airport security, well, it's really twice, but um, uh, once with the laptop pad and uh, that, that gets picked up <laughs> as, a, as a very suspicious looking block in your carry-on. So <laughs> don't be surprised if you kind of have to take that out. Um, but the other is um, my underwear. Uh, going through airport, you know, those, uh, those scanners in the airport, um, in, in any, any real EMF apparel that really works, it will come up as, as a solid kind of, the, the detectors can't pierce it. Not, not, I mean, 
with all EMF shielding, a little radiation gets through, right? That was part of the point of what I told you earlier. But in terms of actually drawing a picture for the security guard, they're going to see just like a, a flat surface and nothing behind it. And so a couple of, not every time, but a few times going through airport security in my SYB boxers, I have had to get the pat down. I normally opt for the pat down anyway, but, um, oh, and Kat, I knew, ah. I knew, I knew what Kathy was going to say, but um, no, I normally opt for the pat down anyway, but sometimes uh, I just, for various reasons, I, yeah, I, I don't need to get into issues of personal preference and trying to avoid um, just dealing with, with annoyed security guards and so forth. But yes, you should always opt out of, um, of the, uh, of the uh, middle of the the the, air, the the body scanners at the airports and opt for the pat down, uh, but it can the, on a few times when I, that hasn't happened, I have been forced into a pat down anyway. Um, but yes, you have metal detectors won't go off, uh, so that's different from the body scanners at the airport. And metal detectors, you can my apparel does not set off metal detectors. Thank you, Sarah. Um, oh, Andrea or Andrea, I apologize, whichever, um, uh, is asking about the difference between the neck gaiter and the bandana because they are made of different materials. Yes, they are. Um, uh, so uh, the bandana is, um, so I designed that actually, it's my only product that is made of silk. It's made of silk and silver. So it's 65% silver, 35% silk. And I designed it to be like a silk bandana, but obviously a little different because it has all that silver, 35% silver in it. And it was meant to be a bit more like, um, like a bandana, right? Uh, more of a, that kind of fabric-y sort of thing. The neck gaiter is 90% silver with 10% spandex. And the spandex is there. And I know a lot of my customers don't like artificial uh, uh, synthetic fabrics. But spandex does a really good job, right? Because the neck gaiter, it's a one size fits all. It has to fit over your head or around your neck, right? It, it, it does all these different use cases. That's the bent. That's why we did a neck gaiter because they're designed to be used in so many different ways. Um, uh, and uh, so because of that, we used a span 10% spandex in the mix. Um, so the neck gaiter has a, has a bit more silver in it and it uses spandex, whereas the bandana is just silver and silk, so it's 100% it's non-synthetic. Um, in terms of shielding effectiveness, they are quite similar. They're not identical, uh, but they're quite similar. And uh, the, big, the, the big difference in the material composition came from uh, just the different use cases. So the bandana was designed to be 100% non-synthetic and also look and feel a bit more like a regular bandana, whereas the neck gaiter was designed to have stretch um, in it. So I hope that answered your question. Thank you. Um, I think some of these I've already answered. Okay, anonymous ask. Um, I'm looking for an outdoor security camera, but I don't want the additional EMF of a wireless camera system. There are wired systems, but I don't know where to start. Do you have any product suggestions or suggestions on the best way to do this while minimizing EMF? Um, it's been a while since I've done a project like that. Uh, I mean, the answer to your question is yes, do a wired system. Uh, there are a ton of them. Uh, I, 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 I did one about 10 years ago, fully wired, uh, that, you know, with the hassle, and it's the, it's the same way with all this stuff. Oh, Kathy has, I'll, I'll, I'll share Kathy's answer in a second. But it's the same way with all of this stuff which is the big hassle is that you have wires that you have to deal with. And depending on how big an area you're trying to provide security, in this case, security for, um, you know, you might need hundreds of feet of camera wiring in order to do that. Um, that said, you, that, so that's the one hassle. Other than that, um, uh, it's, it's really no different. And they provide a lot of the same benefit uh, all of the same benefit is wireless, except without all of uh, the same the same radio emissions. Now, Kathy also said you need to hire a low voltage wiring professional. She conveniently did not share how you can find one of those. So, <laughs> thank you, Kathy. But um, uh, 
base, basically the point that Kathy's making is, you know, not every electrician knows to look for these sorts of things. So in fact, a lot of them don't. So you really want to fo try to find an electrician to help you with this or any kind of project like this that knows how to minimize these forces in the systems they design and implement. Um, and Kathy, if you have any suggestions on how this fellow could, could search for a low voltage wiring professional, I'm, my eyes are on the chat pod, but um, okay. Well, the one thing I can say then is the, um, is the building biology website, the building biology web, institute website has, so I'm gonna share the link there. They have links to experts, um, not all of their experts are gonna be low voltage experts, but they have links to experts all over the country. Some of them will either be the type of expert you're looking for, or will have referrals and know people like that you're looking for. And you'll obviously wanna find them in the part of the country where you're based. Thank you. Um, Okay, so there's a couple questions in here about specific, oh, okay, here we go. Amy asks, how to hang the canopy if you don't have a flat ceiling? Um, you just, so I, I have the same situation. Um, I just moved into a new house. I am mounting a, uh, my canopy and uh, the bedroom has a really slanted ceiling. You know, it's pretty easy. I mean, the, the thing is, is, right, I said there's hoops at the top of the canopy and you put hooks in the ceiling. So the string that connects the hoops to the ceiling, right? It'll be a different height in the front of the canopy than at the back of the canopy. But it's 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 really it's really simple. You just need a kind of a different length string on the different hoops. I hope I explained that well. Uh, maybe maybe when when I actually um, put up my canopy, I'll I'll, I'll share some photos um, so you can see it. But it, it really is just a matter of cutting some different length string. Thank you, Amy. Um, Let's see. Uh, going through here, going through here. Okay, Kim asks, when I'm being lazy, I tend to sleep with my cell phone next to my pillow. When I've done that, I'll wrap the poster frame liner around the pillow. Is that helping or am I deluding myself? Okay, let me just, I know the answer, but let me make sure I get the, the full detail of the question. Okay. When I'm being lazy, I tend to sleep with my cell phone next to the pillow. I'll wrap the poster frame liner around the phone. Okay. Huh. So, um, well, I think just based on the, the tone you used in your question, you know that that's a bad idea. So you shouldn't be doing it. Um, if, you do if you do sleep with your phone, uh, make sure to turn it into airplane mode. There's, there's absolutely, well, okay, I won't say there's absolutely. Um, I remember once I was, I was responsible for the, the health care of, of someone uh, who, 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 who was in, in critical care. And um, I needed my phone on and nearby 24-7. Uh, and that was actually the one time in my life I've slept with my phone and, um, and not in airplane mode. So I won't say there's no instance where you need your phone on all night. Um, but if, if, if you need your phone on all night, definitely do not sleep with it n near your head. Like you're just gonna have to bite the bullet and put it across the room and then go to bed and fall asleep. So if you're falling asleep with your phone, definitely turn it into airplane mode because there's, there, there's just no benefit in having your phone on while you're asleep. Um, you can still use the alarm. Uh, you can still play your games or whatever uh, until you fall asleep, whatever it is you're doing. Um, the part of the question I want to answer has to do with fully wrapping the phone in, in the poster frame liner. So yes, that will provide a shielding effect. Um, but when your phone is on and you're fully shielding it, the phone is going to compensate by boosting the power of the consumption uh, of the emissions, right? Right, because if, if you're fully shielding your phone, it's signal is being interfered with and the phone is smart enough to say, hey, I need to emit a more powerful signal until I can get a connection. And so in the process of doing that, your phone is emitting more radiation. 
Now, how much of that actually is getting through the poster frame liner? You know, you can't know. Very unpredictable, right? Because, and that's why I don't make any products that are designed to fully shield, um, to fully shield your, your devices because that's, you should just be turning it into airplane mode if you're doing that. Um, so the answer to your question is yes, possibly it could be helping to wrap your phone in the poster frame liner. But you know, if you're taking the energy to wrap your phone in the poster frame liner, take that energy and put it into airplane mode instead, because that is a definite way of doing it instead of a maybe sort of possibly way. Also, when your phone boosts its power emissions like that, um, you're draining the battery, uh, which means which means not only that you're going to wake up with a lower battery, you're also putting wear and tear on the battery that doesn't need to happen. So I hope I answered that question, Kim. So uh, we're nearing up here on two hours, and my voice is uh, is nearing its end as well. So I, I want to thank all, and a lot of you are still here in the room. I really, really appreciate um, all of you taking the time uh, to join me tonight. I hope you found this webinar to be uh, useful and informative. Um, again, just a quick reminder, final reminder, the sale is going on till midnight tonight, Pacific time. So it is, uh, so for five more hours, so 20% off my entire catalog, uh, just use the code claim 20 at checkout. Um, the, if you missed any part of this webinar and you want to see it, it will be posted to our YouTube channel probably tomorrow. That's youtube.com slash shield your body. And um, I've already posted the next webinar for you to register if you're interested. That's on May 1st. And that is on EMF and nutrition. Um, so it'll be, it's a great topic, uh, hard to find information on this. And uh, Kathy, a certified nutritionist, as well as a EMF radiation specialist will be giving that uh, webinar. So thank you everyone for coming out. Thank you, Stephanie, for your help. Thank you, Kathy, for heckling from the balcony. And uh, everyone have a great night. Stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, I'll talk to you all soon. Thank you.